right where you are this morning, would you lift your hands? I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for everybody connected this morning, Lord Jesus. We pray for the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding. Father, I pray for these three spirits. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Let it be poured abundantly on every single person that is watching, that is listening this morning. Father, I pray for wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Let those forces be released and unleashed wherever there is foolishness, wherever there is deception, wherever there is slowness to understand, Jesus, release these three mighty forces in somebody's life this morning. May they start understanding. May they begin to see clearly. Oh, Father, may a hunger for knowledge be rekindled Desire to get back to books. Get back to cast box, podcast. Father, I rekindle the desire for knowledge for the scripture says, let him who thinks he knows realize he knows nothing as he ought to know. Father, cause us to be delivered from deceptions. Father, cause us to be delivered from pride and get us back into a childlike attitude that is willing to learn, ready to learn. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. It's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Oh, yes. You are receiving the spirit of wisdom. God is going to help you. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. In all you're getting, get understanding. Spiritual virtues are not very obvious, but they control life. And I pray that you will be a spiritual person, that you will learn to value things of the Spirit. Amen? Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. Just a quick reminder that our conference, the Reason Conference 2023, it's going to be running from the 7th down to the 9th of April. Oh, yes. There will be sessions in every branch nightly from 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. So please make sure you join us for Good Friday in the branch where you are and prepare for this Passover conference mightily. Make sure you join us for the Holy Saturday also from 6 p.m. in the branch where you are. And all our churches will come together at First Love Cathedral on Sunday morning for Resurrection Morning Amen. at Kalanyum. Praise the Lord. Yes. So make sure to join us. It's going to be a great time in the presence of the Lord. Our theme for the year is the cross and the blood. Amen. The cross Amen. and the blood. These are virtues that many believers are not taking advantage of because they are not well taught or well trained or they have forgotten. So this particular Easter conference, we're going to revisit those ancient forces that have led the church to where it is today. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor the cross and the blood not to be missed. And I want to also encourage you to encourage those who, those to whom you are connected to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you are joining us for the first time, make sure you subscribe. Amen. Our numbers have been stagnant for a while now. I, I see that people have stopped doing their job. That is time to get back to work. Amen. We are not a thousand subscribers yet. We must rise and reach that level by the grace of God. So whatever you can do, I know you've subscribed already, but have you encouraged those around you to do the same? If you haven't, do so. Amen? Would you come with me to Matthew 6, 
verse 19 to 21 this morning. Don't store up treasures here on earth. I think it's clear, isn't it? It's a clear instruction. Don't store up treasures here on earth. Meaning, we've learned the first week what a treasure was. Something you value, something that is very important for you. Jesus says such important things, don't keep them down here. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures, these precious things that you value. Store them in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. You are standing a chance of wasting your entire investment, all your efforts and sacrifices, if everything you are doing is for earth. That's what Jesus is saying. You need to look beyond earth. Hallelujah. And where thieves do not break in and steal. Why? For where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Hallelujah. Now the first week we, or the second week rather, we saw one important treasure that you might not be aware of is your soul. Your soul. Your soul is a great treasure. It's a treasure not to be joked with. It's a treasure to treasure. Your soul. Don't be so caught up with materialistic things that you sell your soul. Your soul is very important. Jesus even said, what can you give in exchange for your soul? Value your soul more than anything in this world. Never allow anything to become so important that it causes you to compromise the health of your soul. And value the souls of those around you because that's the greatest treasure. Your soul is your greatest treasure. And the souls of men are the greatest treasure on earth. So those who trade souls are trading the real treasures. Those who are into souls, those who fight for souls are into the real treasure. That is the real gold mine. Do you understand? That's the real mining we should be busy with. Souls. We are digging for souls. We are fighting for souls. Get into that business. Get into that business. Be a soul winner. Become a soul winner. I'm not saying this just because this is our year of soul winning. It's wisdom to be a soul winner. It's great wisdom from God. According to Proverbs, I think 11 verse 30, is great wisdom. Praise the name of Jesus. The second thing that we saw last week that was a great treasure is your name. Your name is a great treasure, especially if your name end up written in the book of life. There's nothing more treasurable than having your name written in the book of life. It's a very important thing. It's a great thing. And I want to encourage you to get into the business of getting people's names written in the book of life. It's a great treasure. It's a great treasure. In fact, that is the access into heaven like we learned last week. I pray for you that your name will remain written there and that you will fight to make sure those that God gives you their names get written there. Amen. Their names get written. Let it be their own decision to decide not to have their names written, but let it not be your mistake that I didn't tell you, I didn't make it plain to you. No. No. And this morning, we're going to just look at one other treasure that I think, you see, let me tell you something. I'm aware that this message might not be very popular. I'm aware. Because the church, unfortunately, has fallen into materialism. So much so that 
If we could rewrite the Bible, I'm sure we would rewrite it. Just to suit us. It's true. It's true. So I know the things I'm teaching currently are not very exciting to your to your to you. Do you understand? Like they are not exciting to your daily life and the things you are busy with at the moment. Yeah. But I want to tell you something. Listen to me. This series of teachings on treasures in heaven probably will be by far the most important set of teachings you would have heard because most of the things I've taught you that have to deal with earth will end in earth. At this stage, God has translated us into something that is ahead of us, where we are headed. And we are trying as much as we making sure, I don't want you to be a poor man on earth, don't get me wrong. But I don't want you to either be a frustrated man in heaven. It's wisdom to read the, I think they call it the paper, is it a question paper? When you are doing an exam, there are always question papers. Past questions, past questions. Past questions are the master key into preparing for an exam because they usually repeat themselves. Past questions. Past questions have helped a lot of people pass their exams. Easily, without a lot of stress. You just look at the past questions and you prepare based on the past questions. Don't try to read the whole book. Look at the past questions. They are usually similar, even if it's not. And sometimes it is the exact question that you are being asked. Past questions. Can I tell you something? Heaven has past questions. Jesus came with the whole script of all past questions. And he presented it to us that this is what is going to happen. First of all, your soul is more important than anything you know. Work to preserve your soul. Work to preserve the souls of people around you. I know around you, nobody is telling you that. Nobody is advertising that. You won't see that information on TV. You won't find it anywhere. I understand. But I promise you, that past question will be very important soon. Because the heavens and the earth shall pass away, the words of Jesus will never pass away. And Jesus told the disciples, don't rejoice that things are working for you on earth. Don't rejoice that you managed to sort out this. Don't rejoice that this is. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's another important thing that a lot of people are, they are rejoicing that they bought a new disc, they have a new disc, but they are not interested if their names are written in heaven. They are not interested. And I will not be surprised that even you watching me this morning, you are not really interested much. I mean, you couldn't care less if your name is written to some books in heaven, like that doesn't seem to bad, bother. You want your name into somebody's phone down here. You want your name into some books down here. I understand you. But I promise you, these past questions will become so important one of these days. And you'll be so glad this teaching was done. And I pray for you that when we are now all being examined, we will come out not wanting that uh, we've prepared well. We didn't live our life as if everything was ending on earth. We became aware of something else beyond earth. And we lived our life on earth with that understanding, with that reality. And that's why we said at the beginning of the series that this was really to build strong conviction because a lot of us, 
We claim things that we are not living according to. Like, you claiming to go to heaven, but you are doing nothing that can actually show that that is where you are going. So it is a clear proof to yourself that you don't believe in the things you are talking about. You don't believe in them. We need to confront our own convictions and ask ourselves hard questions. Do I really believe in these things that I talk about the whole time? Because if I believe in them the way I'm claiming to believe in them, anytime you believe you're going to go somewhere, you start preparing for that place. There's never been a place you went to that was measured without any form of preparation. You've always prepared. If you really believe you are going to heaven, if you really believe that what God says in his word is true, then look at your preparation and tell me if you really believe it. Do you really believe it the way you say you believe it? If you do, then your preparation is really, your preparation has a lot of catch up to do. Because as, when you look at your preparation, you seem to be more convinced that you'll be here forever. Hmm? Let's wake up, people of God. Let's wake up. Like I'm saying, I know my message might not be very popular, and I'm not trying to be popular. I'm trying to be accurate. When I stand before Jesus, I want to be able to say, Lord, whatever you asked me to preach, I preached it. Or at least the most I could, I tried. Yeah, so that nobody will say, ah, he never preached, he was always preaching this, preaching this, establishment, progress, this and that. He never said anything about treasures in heaven, even though you, Jesus, you said it. He never, he never, now I want to be, these are my titles. Treasures in heaven. Week one. Store, uh, store souls. Store names. Things that, are, that have nothing to do with earth. And you see that thinking it's easy to do a series a whole month talking about something that is not seeming to put people food on their table. Like you think it's easy. It's not easy to do that. I must be having some serious convictions myself to be standing here talking the whole month about something that will not give you food today. There must be something I believe. There must be something I'm convinced about. That if you and I can align ourselves with this, we'll get somewhere in time. This morning, quickly for the time we have, store up good works in heaven. Store up good works. We are talking about things that can be stored in heaven while you yourself, you are still on earth. Those are the things we are talking about. We saw you could store souls. We saw you could store names. And this morning, I want to tell you something. You can store good works in heaven. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, this voice is not from earth, from heaven, a voice came, saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I didn't think there was anything good about, anything blessed about dying. So he said, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Tell your neighbor, make sure you die in the Lord. Make sure you die. Don't backslide and you die. It will not be nice. Die in the Lord. Live in the Lord and die in the Lord. That's a good way to die. I said that's a good way to die. You, you lived in the Lord and you died in the Lord. You never pull out. You never went away. You kept yourself till your dying day. 
hmm, to die in the Lord. Many started in the Lord, but they didn't die in the Lord. Die near a tavern somewhere. Die in some funny places with a girlfriend. Die, some funny things. Die in the Lord. In the will of God. Doing the work of God. The Bible says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Why are they blessed? Yes, says the Spirit. That they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. They rest from their labors and their works follow them. If you remember the first week, Solomon told us that he was a very frustrated man. Because everything he worked for, he has to leave it behind. And he's not even sure if the successors he will have will be wise or foolish. But in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit released a very powerful information that if you die in the Lord, your labors and your works will follow you. Amen. What is the first implication? If you died in the Lord and your labors and your works are following, it means when you were alive in the Lord, you were working. You cannot die in the Lord and your works are following you when there, are, there is no works. First of all, you cannot rest if there was nothing you were doing. So it says that, that they may rest from their labors. It implies they were laboring when they were alive. This is not a very good news for those of us that have made Christianity a contemplation. <laughs> eh? We come and sit and we just watch others killing themselves. It ha- it, I don't think this is a good news because this verse doesn't say, blessed are the pastors who die in the Lord. The verse says, blessed are the dead. Ah, are you not going to die? Everyone's going to die. So, it's not the dead pastors. It's just the dead that die in the Lord. They are labors. So if you are in the Lord when you are alive, there must be some labors. They are works. There must be some works. There's got to be some laboring going on for you to be resting from your labors. And there's got to be some work going on for you, for, for, for the works to be following you. I've been trying to make us aware of something in this church. That I think we misunderstood Christianity. And we are still to a certain degree. And I'm, let me not go ahead of myself. Can I tell you something? There are two kinds of works on earth. Two. Because he's talking here that your, their works will follow them. Which ones? Okay, there are two kinds of works on earth. Number one, industry work. Number two, ministry work. You are either involved in industry work or you are involved in ministry work. You are either involved in secular work or you are involved in sacred work. You are either involved in working for God or you are involved in working for Caesar. You are always somewhere working somewhere there. Mark 12, 20, 17. Well, then Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. On your journey on earth, you will be given to two entities. You will either be giving to Caesar or you will be giving to God. You will either be industry or ministry. It will be secular or sacred. You have to know that those things are there. 
Now, when you decide to work for God, we call it ministry. Ministry is working for God. Ministry or the work of ministry. When you accept the call of God for your life, that we call it ministry. Are you following me carefully? Yes, now, ministry is not for pastors only because I repeat to you, in Revelation, he's not saying, blessed are the, dead, the pastors that died. He said, blessed are the dead. Their labors, they rest from their labors, and their works, their works follow them. This is not about pastors. It's about anyone who was in the Lord. Anyone in the Lord must have works. That's why I want to make you aware. And the work that we are talking about here is not a secular work, as I will show you just now. It's sacred work, ministry. And I'm starting by making you aware that ministry is not for pastors only. No. That's the mistake that we've made from the very beginning. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. The Bible says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. These are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These are the gifts, the fivefold ministry. This is what God gave. Jesus gave this gift to the church. Now, the Bible goes on to say in verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. Look at that scripture very well. The responsibility of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist, and the teacher is not to do the work per se, but it is to equip God's people so that God's people will do the work of God. That's why Jesus says in the book of Matthew 22, verse 14, many are called. Many, many are called. It's not two people that are called. It's many people that are called. And I want to believe this morning, you are called by God. You, you who is watching me now, you are called by God to do something for God. Not to come and sit every week, listen to a good sermon, uh, give a little offering, go home and live your whole week working for industry. Live your whole week working for secular. Then Sunday morning you come and sit uninterested and non-participatively sit there and listen to his little sermon you are half asleep the time and then after that you come and give a little offering then you go home and you continue and you want to tell me when you die the, those works will follow you those are the works that will follow you no 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 you are called by god Amen. john 15 verse 16 you did not choose me but i chose you you did not, do you, do you know that you didn't choose Jesus? Jesus made a conscious decision to choose you. And he's telling you why. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Work, work, work. Fruit that will last. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, it may be given to you. Are you listening to me? Now, this scripture is very interesting because it encompasses Christianity. John 15, 16 tells you everything about Christianity. First of all, Christianity is not your idea. It's Jesus' idea. Jesus is the one who takes the first step, not you. The day you give your life to Jesus, that's the day you discover Jesus. But Jesus knew you a long time ago. Long, he died for you a long time ago. He chose you a long time ago. Do you understand? And then it also tells you why he chooses you. 
So let's look at Christianity quickly. What, 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 are, what are the elements that are in Christianity? Number one, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with a living God. You should never forget this because as soon as you make Christianity a religion, it becomes something that you are disengaged from. You just do a few do's and don'ts and then you pull out. You are not necessarily a part of it. It's like the thing is there and you are here. You have your own things, the thing has its own things. Christianity is not like that. Christianity is not just some dead religion that you relate with once or twice a year. It's a relationship. A relationship means there's a flow of life in the thing. It means there's interaction. We find this in John 17 verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know. Relationship, you have to know. You have to know. Not fear, not run away from, but know. Know God. Know Jesus. Intimately. That's a relationship. When you know somebody, you know what they like, you know what they don't like, you know what they want to do, and you know, you know everything about the person. You cannot tell me you are in a relationship with a person, but you don't know them. The basis of relationship is knowledge. You start knowing about the person, or you start knowing the person. Another thing to know about Christianity is that because Christianity is a relationship, just as any other relationship, it has duties and privileges. Are you with me? Every relationship has privileges, but every relationship also has duties. Oh, yeah. When you are relating with a person, in that relationship, you notice that there are privileges that you are accessing because you are relating with the person. But if it is a true and a genuine relationship, you will quickly notice that it's not only privileges. There are also duties. Things you have to now start doing as you are relating with this person. As soon as you see Christianity as a relationship, everything that is written in the Bible starts making sense. But if Christianity is a religion, you will always feel disengaged and you will never understand most of the things that Jesus is talking about. Take off your cross. Why? Where am I going? You will never understand most of these things. Yeah, like, like you will be a Christian that does not obey the word of God because you, it can, you, it does, you don't relate with it. You cannot relate with it. You can only start relating with the word of God when Christianity is a relationship. And a relationship has duties and responsibilities. Now, we as Christians of today are 100% aware of the, 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 the duties, I mean the responsibilities, I mean the, the, the privileges. We know them. Any Christian you meet anywhere. In fact, most churches today are banking on the, response, the, the, the privileges. Almost everything that is happening is, what am I getting? 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 That's why you talk about your healing, your breakthrough, your miracle, your open heaven, your new dimension, your increase. All of that, and it's true, but you are just one sided. Those are the privileges. That is where he's saying at the bottom of John 16, 
I will give you whatever you ask. I'll give it to you. You are focusing on the privileges, but before these privileges, there are duties as well. Every relationship that is a genuine relationship cannot only have privileges. No way. You cannot say, I'm dating you, but don't expect anything from me. I'll eat your food. I'll use your money. I'll drive your car. But I don't want to hear you place any demand on me at any level. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right for you to be placing demands on me. You say you love me, and if you love me, you will just do anything I want. You will do anything I want because you love me again. You said you love me. So now, why are you not asking for anything? Hmm? I heard the story of a girl. This guy kept buying her gifts. And she kept saying to people, no, no, there's nothing between us. Oh, there's nothing between us. He bought her a cell phone. Oh, he bought just, yeah. He's just a friend. Just a friend. Wow. What a friend. Just a friend. The guy is giving you money. The guy is buying you a cell phone. He's bringing you lunch. And except if you are a duck. Do you know what I said? A duck doesn't think much. Ask your neighbor, are you a duck? That you are just in your own world, believing that a person can be buying you a cell phone, giving you money, bringing you lunch. You are enjoying the privileges and there will never be a duty. Baby, get ready for some duty. The duties are coming. They are coming. They are coming. You understand? That's why we say, if you are not ready for the duties, don't take the privileges. Don't, don't start taking somebody's money and you know that you can't, you can't deliver. You can't deliver. True Christianity indeed has privileges. Come to me. I will give you rest. That's the privilege. But then it says, take my yoke. That's the duty. You did not choose me. I chose you. That you might go and bear fruit, that's the duty. Whatever you ask, I will give you, that's the privilege. It's a, it's a plain relationship. It's clear. It's clear. There are privileges, but there are also duties. Yes. Yeah, the duty, I mean, which is the duty always comes first. I want to know why you are here. Mm. So, this Christianity that you and I have been busy with. This Christianity where we are just coming every Sunday, there's nothing that we, we are doing. Like we don't see anything that we can do. We are just here to get. Oh, I don't understand where that Christianity is coming from. But it, it has spoiled the church. This Christianity has spoiled the church. That's why the media to the people have even created YouTube channel just for the church, just to expose the church. Things that you never used to see before. But because today the church has lost its direction. People have even gotten jobs just to reveal the lost direction. But the church of Jesus Christ shall never lose its direction. There will be people who are there and who continue to hold on to the truth about this gospel, this everlasting gospel. True Christianity will always involve responsibility. Listen to Jesus in Mark 4, verse 19. Come, follow me. That's your invitation to follow. I mean, this is Jesus personally calling you to enjoy Christianity. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Wow. Wow. I send you out to do what? It's in your Bible. I will send you out to fish for people. 
When we say to you, bring three people to church, you say, hey, these people, they are always after people. They are after people. They always want me to, I must get people. Every day, goals, uh, reports, this and this and this. The instruction is clear. Go fish for people. That's the job he's giving you and me. Let's go, let's go fish for people. Because at the end of the day, it's about people. It's not about the chairs. It's not about the sound. It's not about the roof. It's not about the ceiling. It's not about the floor. It's about people. People. Let's go fish for people. So your anger, that anger you are having every time with your shepherd, you are having an anger with everybody. Every time, every time you see your phone, it's, it's, it's questions about people. That, your anger is just starting because we're not going to stop with this thing with people if this is what Jesus gave us to do. You might just learn, you might as well learn to manage your anger. I just manage this anger that you are having because Honestly speaking, we cannot change the Bible. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. That's clear. Not fishers of gold. Not diggers of gold. Gold diggers. No. Fishers of men. That's the responsibility that he has given us. You know, we have failed Jesus. When you spend your whole week, you didn't fish for one person. Sisters, fish. Go fishing. Brothers, go fishing. It is a fishing, this is a fishing company. Yeah. You must take your fishing lane, get on the job. Get on the job. What does it mean to fish for people? Soul winning. That's it. Witnessing. Becoming ambassadors for Christ. Reconciling the world to God. Being the light of the world. Being the salt of the earth. All of that are different ways to say the same thing. Go fish for people. Go fish for people. So as Christians, we are saved to do good works. Not to sit and watch good works. We are saved to do good works. Ephesians 2 verse 10. I'm going to read it in three versions for you to understand very well. New King James Version. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. That is your new birth. That is you becoming born again. You are created in Christ Jesus. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. So you are a newborn person. A newborn again. You are born again. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the purpose. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's not even an accident. As you are in the church feeling that I'm oppressing you, I'm abusing you, that's okay. Then forget salvation. Renounce salvation. Because the purpose of salvation is for you to do good works. Let's look at it in the NIV. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In advance. God prepared certain things in advance for you to do. Wow, how could that be clearer? God prepared in advance for you to do good works. Say with me, good works, good works. Good works. Good works. Good works. Good works. Good works. If there are good works, there are bad works. And, and we are focusing on the good works this morning. And we want to stop because only good works can be stored in heaven. Good works. Things we are doing for God and for his kingdom. Now, New Living Translation. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. He planned it. You are just seeing something happen to the best. 
You see, some of you, oh, I cannot be a cell leader. God planned for you to be a cell leader long before you were born. God planned for you to be a shepherdess. God planned for you to be a shepherd. It's, there's no accident about this. We are just helping you unveil the plan of God for your life. Now you are angry. I don't know why you are angry at, at, at us. Meanwhile, we are just helping you discover what God planned long ago for you. Many people will rise up from this and take their position. Because, and I'm talking especially to those who always feel inadequate. Hey, am I supposed to do this? Is it for me? He planned long ago. He planned long ago. He planned long ago. You are called. I say you are called. You, you are called by God. You are called. Okay, if you are not called, then you are not saved. Because, yes, because, no, no, you are not saved. If you are not called, you are not saved. Because he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Created for good works. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Nobody should sit there ever again and tell me, Pastor, me, I don't think it's for me. Then you are not saved. Go join another religion. And as far as, and you are, you are joining no other religion. You're going to be a Christian and you're going to do the work of ministry till you leave this world by the grace of God. You're not going to have it that easy as you are thinking. You know why I want you to do this? Because it is only these good works that God will recognize in heaven. I hope you are not thinking that as you are, I don't know where you are working. Actually, where do you work? That thing you are busy with. Every day you go there, you give your best, you push. I hope you are not thinking that that is what, that thing that is even the reason why you don't come to church. That thing that is the reason why you don't tie it, you don't, there are so many things you don't do because of that thing you are busy with. I hope you are not sitting there this morning feeling to yourself, hey, I'm going to, God is going to do something for these good works I've been doing. Those are not good works. Let's be clear about what good works are. First John 2, 17. And the world is passing away and the last of it. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. He who does the will of God will abide forever. So it will continue. There are certain things, if you are doing it and it is the will of God, that thing will continue forever. It will not stop. Let's read again Revelation 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who died in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow them. As you enter eternity, your works will follow you behind plenty. Everywhere you went for Jesus, whatever you did for Jesus, it will be following you behind like a shadow. And that's why you will be able to hear in Matthew 25, verse 23. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. These are the things I would like us to hear. I don't know if they don't matter to you. Say, well, Pastor, me, I'm here. I just want a job. If I can get my job, I'm okay. When I die, I will rest. I just let, it, let's, let me tell you something. That job might not even bring rest to. It's because you're not working here that you're talking like that. You don't know job. You don't know job well. I pray for you that you will all have jobs. But I also pray for you that you will have a real work. Let your job be a job. Your job is not your work. 
Your job is something you're doing to get a little bit of money so you can do your work. Your work is your ministry. Your job is your industry. But your work is your ministry. That is where you are. Get something this side to even push this side. That's wisdom. Get educated. Moses was trained in the wisdom of the Egyptians. And then God sent him back to Egypt to deliver the people from there. Jesus Christ was a carpenter all his life. That was his industry. By the time came, he turned to his ministry. Elisha was a farmer for many years. A time came, he turned to his ministry. Paul was a tent maker for many years. A time came, he turned to his ministry. Peter, James, John, Andrew were fisher of fish for many years. The time came, they turned to their ministry. You must turn to your ministry. Don't tell me, I'm this, I can't do this. I'm this, I can't do this. I've given you different, including the Lord Jesus. Some of you are thinking that Jesus was just a savior all his life. Jesus was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. Working at his ministry. When the time came, God will reward your good works in heaven. Amen. Revelation 22 verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. The work he's talking about that is not your work at Coca-Cola. Your work at Coca-Cola is not benefiting Jesus. It is your work as a missionary your work as a disciple maker, your work as a soul winner, your work as a cell leader, your work as a pastor, your work as a church planter, your work as somebody who visits people, your work as somebody who makes call, calls people, gathers people, prays, fasts, that work is called the work of God. The work of Coca-Cola cannot be the work of God. The work of God is the work of God, and Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola. You must know the difference. So give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Stop joking around. Hebrews 6 verse 10. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name. So now it is very clear. The work he's talking about is the labor of love you have shown towards towards his name. Something you were doing for his name. So it cannot be Coca-Cola, please. In that you have ministered to the saints. And you do minister. His ministry. Tell your neighbor his ministry, his ministry. It cannot be industry, his ministry. Industry can be used to fuel the ministry. But never ever say to yourself, I think I'm too busy, I can't serve God. Then you are giving away your eternity like that. Praise the Lord. I see us getting busy with some good works. I see, I see us getting busy with some good works. Good works, good works. Good works. What are some of the good works you can do for God? Number one, live right. Right living is a good work. Do you know it is work to live right? It's a 24-7 work. My God. This thing that you are carrying, do you understand this thing? To control this guy is work. That's why when you go home, you are tired. And you can't remember exactly what did I do to be this time. No, you were working. You are trying to control the eyes, the thoughts, the hands, the fingers. Oh! Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present. It's a presentation. Anybody that goes to do presentation, it's work. They are working. They are doing presentation. You present your body a living sacrifice. 
That's the problem. The problem is that the thing is alive and it must be sacrificed. That's what makes it a lot of work. And God wants it to be holy. God wants it to be acceptable. And he wants it to be a reasonable service. So you are doing some service. Do you understand yourself? So living right is work. Making sure when you come to church. Hey. Wow. You've done the first work before these other ones. The first work is living right. Hmm? Oh, yes. oh yes. And we're gonna you see, God can never ask you to do something without enabling you to do it. When God says present your body, don't use your own power to do that. You will never manage. God empowers you to do whatever He asks you to do. Whenever you try to obey God with your own strength, you will end on the floor. The Bible says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to obey my status. It is God who produces in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So you cannot do the will of God without the help of God. Don't take this and say, hey, no, 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 I'd rather wake up. I've been really missing up this, 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 this particular work. No, yes, you have to bring your will in it, but trust the power of God to help you. And you will see, you'll be able to do it. Another good work is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is a good work. It's a great work. Luke 2, 36, 37. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Azair. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity and this woman was a widow for about 84 years. So she got married, seven years after getting married, her husband died. And she was a widow for 84 years. Now the Bible says, she did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. You see, you can serve God, you can work for God by fasting, praying, fasting, praying. She served God. Whenever you take on a fast, you are working. Our Friday fast that you keep dodging, you are dodging work. You are dodging work. Whenever you take on the job fully, you are serving God. You know, you are doing many things. You are presenting the body and you are serving it because fasting affects the body. So you are doing the first one and you are doing the second one. You are getting a double salary for that one. Good works. Pray for your leaders. It's a good work. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. When Pastor Pascal comes where you are and you see how God is using him mightily, always pray, Father, wherever he goes, let it be like this. Let the power be like this. You are working for God when you do that. You are doing a good work. Good works. Good works. Good works. Invite people to change. These are good works. Psalm 122 verse 1. I was glad when they said, be that day, you are day. When they said to me, somebody said it and it can be you. Let us go to the house of God. Who was they? It's you and me. When they said, I want you to replace there with your name. I was glad when so and so said to me, let us go. It's a good work. Good works. Good works. Compelling people to come to church. 
anakazo. There's a dimension where you invite them. Another dimension, you take them by the head and you pull them inside. Luke 14, 23. Then the master told his servants, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be filled. You know why our churches are not full? People are not doing the good works. The beautiful job is not being done. Good works. And I cancel them in. Compel them to come. There's a dimension you invite. Another dimension you now compel. It's a good work. It's a good work. Yeah, people will say you are too desperate. Yes, I'm desperate for Jesus. I'm desperate for souls. Yes, it's not a problem. Sunday morning, you should have two attires. An Akazu attire and stage attire. In the morning, when you are doing an Akazu, you can't be doing an Akazu with heels. You must have jeans and take his. You do an Akazu attire. You pull them and then you go to the bathroom and you change. Yeah. Good works. Good works. Use your gift and your talents. Do something in the house of God. Are you a singer? Use it. Are you a drama star? Use it. Are you a dancer? Use it. Use your gift. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. Each part. Each part does its own special our churches will grow strongly when each part start doing its own special work each part you see your body the eyes are doing their work the nose is doing its work the hair is doing its work the hand each part is doing its work then the church is the body of christ and you are part of that body so each part must do its work Good works. Run a cell. Become a cell. Run a cell. Good works. Pay your tithe. Pay your tithe is a good work. Every month, faithfully put in your tithe. Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is God speaking. My house must not fall apart. Meanwhile, I bless you. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you may not have room enough to contain it. Support God's work. Luke 8 verse 3. And Johanna, the wife of Susa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. These are women who were supporting the ministry of Jesus. I will not be surprised that a good number of you, Jesus has spoken to you, do this, do this for my house. But you are holding. Hmm, pastor. But the other people are not doing it. Why must I be the one to do it? Jesus is speaking to you. He has instructed you many times, change this, buy this for me, for my house. And you're looking around. Ah, am I the only one here? You are missing it. It's an opportunity for a good work. Opportunity. Good works. Win souls. Win souls. Just be in it every week. The other time I was traveling with some guys and they kind of asking them, okay, we are now in, you know, I mean, this is March. You, how many souls have you won so far? You, how many souls have you won so far? And each were giving me the numbers of souls they've won so far. I feel like asking you the same question. 
you. How many souls have you won so far for Jesus? In our year of soul winning, what could be a better work than winning souls? I'm not talking about just bringing back souls that were already won before. I'm talking about new souls. People who don't know Jesus that you and I are reaching to and pulling back in the ship pen. Soul winning. That's the essence of this series. Treasures in heaven. It's all about prioritizing what heavens values the most and making it a priority as well. So you at all, how many souls have you won since January until now? Is it two? Is it three? Is it one? I don't want to say, is it nothing? You know better. But there's no better work than the work of soul winning. When the Lord Jesus appeared to Kenneth Hagin the first time, he appeared before Kenneth Hagin with a crown. Kenneth Hagin said, if I remember well, he had never seen such a beautiful crown like that before. And my, my, to my own surprise, the first words of Jesus to Papa Hagin was, this is a soul winner's crown. This is a soul winner's crown. This is a soul winner's crown. Soul winners are crowned all the time, not by man, by Jesus. This is a soul winner's crown. He was wearing white and he was holding a crown in his hand. He says to Papa again, this is a soul winner's crown. We are entering April. How many souls have you won to the Lord? How many have you brought back? But I'm sure you are sitting there with your list of privileges. Jesus, I'm still waiting for you to do this for me. This is a spirit. The community is falling in the hands of wrong people. can do more. Hmm? We can be more intentional. More people can be touched if we are willing. Jesus can use us. Don't look at your capacity. Don't look at your strength. Look to Jesus. If the desire for souls can just enter your heart this morning, you pass the street and you see them, it touches you. Are they saved? Do they know, Lord? Do they know the Lord? When you see groups of two, groups of three walking by the roadside, ask yourself, are these, are these ones saved? When you see a group of seven walking together, laughing, are they saved? Where are they going? If that heart can become your portion from tonight, I tell you, Jesus will do a lot through your life. He will empower you. And who knows, maybe before the end of the year, you will be in crown, enthroned with a crown on your head. So winner's crown. So winner's crown. I've been feeling tempted to even offer money to people to say, whoever can win more souls by the end of the year, I'll give them money. I've been tempted to do such things, but I just felt Jesus doesn't do that. He didn't tell me I should. He, he gives himself the blessing to the people. I felt so tempted many times that I, I want to put a price. Whoever can win this number of souls for Jesus by the end of this year, I give them 5,000 rand, I give them 3,000 rand. I want, I've been feeling to do so. Maybe I will do it, I don't know. God, that's my desire that more souls souls will be one to the kingdom of God. I'm just hoping and praying that you will be motivated 
not because of money, but because somebody won you to Jesus and somebody didn't have to get money for you to be won. I don't know why now. We must pay you people to be won. Jesus. And I don't want to lie, this is the thought that has been causing me for a while now. I pray for us that as we close this series on treasures in heaven, it will become clear we all have treasures in heaven. All our treasures are not loaded here on earth. We are constantly translating and depositing in that other realm for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for this series. We are all in your hands this morning. We pray and ask, Lord Jesus, myself, I pray for grace, grace to apply everything I've taught this year, this month. Grace to rediscover your heart and your purpose for my life and for the life of this church. Grace, Lord, that this church may never deviate from the main purpose for which you called us, that shepherds and shepherdesses and cell leaders and men, men and women in this church will never have an agenda greater than the agenda of heaven, that we will never find ourselves lost into things that are perishable and miss the main thing that could have given us immortality. Lord, have mercy on Allah Bible Church. Cause us to move towards the right direction. Cause every member to become a staunch soul winner, a lover of Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. I thank you this morning. I pray for everybody that will listen to this message even a year from now, that that spirit of soul winning will enter them. It's entering them now. Desire to win a soul, to have a little outreach, to buy a Bluetooth speaker, to arrange a little group, to take your cell on outreaches, to have monthly outreaches goals, clear direction. The mandate is clear. It's, us to just, it's just for us to not get on the move. Father, help us. Help us, Jesus. I pray for this church. Do not allow this church to descend and become like every other one has become. Keep us alive through soul winning, Lord. May life flow continuously in us as we give birth every week. Let every Sunday be a celebration because souls are won, because invitations were made, follow-ups are done, and souls are won. I pray for us, Lord, that we'll have the spirit of Caleb, another spirit different from the spirit of the other guys, another spirit that can see the mind of God and flow with God. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Those of us that have become blindly disobedient to your instructions, please forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, that we, our minds have become so clothed on earth. It's as if this is heaven for us. And we have called it heaven on earth. Heaven can never be on earth. Heaven is heaven. Earth is earth. Thank you, Lord, for helping us this morning. I want to pray for you as you are watching me. You want to give your life to Jesus. You can just raise your right hand wherever you are. God bless you. Repeat these words after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you this morning. Please forgive me my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe you died for me. On the third day you rose again, that I might be justified. Right now, I believe my sins are forgiven. I'm justified by your blood. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm called. I'm a child of God. I am free from the power of sin to serve the living God. As a soul winner, as a church planter, as a cell leader, as a shepherd, as a lay pastor, I will be one of these things in my lifetime. 
So help me, Lord. So help me, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, the Holy Ghost is working in you. I promise you, He will not remain a chair warmer in that branch where you are. God is going to lift you. You're going to save Him mightily for His glory. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me this whole month for this series. It was a great blessing and a privilege to teach you the word of the Lord and the word of the book of life. Now, next month, it's just around the corner. You know, the first week, we're going to be in church with the communion. The second week, is going to be the Easter conference. Please start preparing. Let it be a soul-winning festival for us through the cross of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Those are the primary tools for the salvation of mankind. So we're going to have a feast of soul winning during those two, during this Easter conference. Amen. May God bless your church. May God bless your ministry. May your calling become clear. And may God cause your calling to be really established in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for, uh, what we have already prayed, let's share the grace of the Lord in fellowship. One, two, three, let's go. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. 2023, my year of soul winning. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I will lead many people to Jesus. I will win souls to the kingdom. So help me, Lord. I believe you've been helped by this series, isn't it? Let's now go and apply. God bless you. Seek first the kingdom of God.